you know, guys, they go on vacation for the week and the markets, well, didn't do much. I come back to the office and nothing got done either. It's like the day the earth stood still. Man, oh man, I guess if I'm not here, markets aren't moving and nobody's doing any work. Must be nice to be you guys. Dad, did you notice that Ryan was out of the office? I couldn't tell. You know what, Chris? Ryan's literally the equivalent of the tree falls in a forest. And if, nobody there, if nobody's there, you don't hear anything, right? There's no noise. Um, but I just, and I'll tell you what, that, and, that's, and that's a great lesson about the markets. You know, time passes, markets operate, doesn't care what you think, how you feel, or whether you're traveling around Europe. Well, I was grateful we didn't get a huge sell-off, but it's interesting. I mean, we had a little bit of selling the last couple of weeks. And I was trying to catch up on some of my reading on the plane on the way back, so financial reading. And it's just like all of a sudden the naysayers come out in droves, right? All of a sudden the inverted yield curve, well, it's going to predict recession. It hasn't yet, but guess what? We're 19 months. And at 19 months, a lot of times that's when the recession hits. And all these reasons why the economy and the market's ready to fall off a cliff doesn't make much to, uh, you know, to, turn, to move the needle on, uh, on sentiment to the negative. It blows my mind. Well, clearly, Rai, you know why the market corrected. Uh, poor old Mikey Wilson changed his tune once again. He, he went from a 4,500 target on the S&P. Wait till you hear this. Drum roll, please. Really brave forecast. 5,400 this year. That poor yeah. guy. Every time he makes opens his mouth, the market does exactly the opposite of what he thinks is going to happen. He should be a bond analyst. You know, he could tell you exactly when a bond matures and how much money he'll get back. I have a lot of empathy for Morgan Stanley's chief strategist. Must be hard. Um, here's the smallest buy loan in the world. But, I mean, that's also goes to show it's just impossible to predict the short-term market. Uh, but meantime, you know, the old saying of sell in May and go away, it's all of a sudden starting to sound smart again because markets are selling off a little bit. Um, we don't know how long the Fed's going to keep interest rates at these levels, maybe higher for longer. And you just hear the drumbeat of the negative news. But at the end of the day, it's like, hey, go away in May, but don't sell. That doesn't rhyme, so never mind. But I think the point here is you don't want to get out of your portfolio here. There's a lot of opportunity out there. Well, just because the S&P, the Dow, the NASDAQ made all-time record highs while you were gone, right? That might be some impetus for people to sell. Well, hey, I sold at the top. It can't go any higher. It's already at the top, right? I think that's the problem sometimes when you look at a chart or a graph of the market. It's in a rectangle, and when you see a, a perpendicular line going left to right, you know, there, you look at the top of the box, you go, well, it can't go any higher. Look, there's a there's a border there on the chart. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, I think what everybody really would benefit from if you could just take the last 40 years, last 50 years, last 100 years, and, and just replay that return over the next 40, 50, or 100 years, you're going to see the same thing. So we're not just at 40,000. We're going to 50,000, 60,000. Hopefully in my lifetime, definitely in yours, based on uh, my experience, guys. Well, you know, yeah. with all the rage with uh, with AI being so popular and, you know, everybody's favorite stock, NVIDIA, going through the roof. You know, Dad, you and I were playing with uh, ChatGTP this weekend and Microsoft Copilot. We asked it, we said, hey, where's the market going over the next 40 years based on past performance? And all it did was give us a summary of what happened in the past. So even AI can't tell you where the market's going. Wait a minute, Chris. It did refer to that fortune teller in the boardwalk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's what's remarkable, right? I mean, we've got this just huge outsized performance from one stock named NVIDIA, the only stock that's genuinely capitalizing on this whole AI revolution. You got all these other mega cap stocks like Google, Microsoft, spending huge dollars um, you know, to get these graphic processing units that NVIDIA has, but they have no idea what kind of return on investment they're going to get. And that's kind of a scary place to be because you know we don't really know um, if this demand is going to last for a long time. We know that semiconductor stocks are typically cyclical, and at some point the music could stop in a very severe way. And I think that's why, again, the one thing we've been emphasizing on this show is don't get seduced by putting all your money in one place. It's a great time to broaden out your exposure because there's a lot of places in the market right now that are working and that are benefiting from this whole artificial intelligence track. Hey, wait a minute, Rye. First of all, NVIDIA hit an all-time record high. Maybe it's at 35, 40 times earnings. But it's driving the performance of our large-cap growth portfolio. I'm all for it. Keep going. <laughs> I'm cheering. But here's the amazing thing. There are other unintended consequences uh, you know, a, a new paradigm in technology. You, you need a lot more energy. So suddenly utility stocks have become the hot AI stocks over the last couple of months. And it's being driven, also it's being driven higher are pipeline investments because you need to transport a lot of natural gas 
you know, to fuel those uh, utility uh, power plants. So, you know, up until this week, our pipeline index was the best performing index in the in the entire portfolio in the entire market. And now that Nvidia has had a huge week, yeah, you know, large cap growth is our biggest winner. I'll take two, three, four big winners. I'm I'm good with that. Well, I, I think the difference there is too is like take energy pipelines for instance. They're just trades so much cheaper, and you're getting a five six percent dividend, which you know tells me one thing is cash flow right now is cheap, and most people aren't capitalizing on that because let's face it. Pipelines, building new pipelines of political football, there's only so many of them. And energy demand is going to continue to go higher over the course of the next decade. And you're going to still need fossil fuels. So there's great hedges you want to have in your portfolio that unintendedly, but like you said, Bob, are going to benefit from artificial intelligence. And you're getting paid really well. And they trade a lot cheaper than 40 times earnings on NVIDIA. Hey, Chris, I'm so happy Ryan reminded us there's an election this year. Of course, we're going to hear about pipelines now. Remember the old XL pipeline <laughs> controversy? So... Yeah, I, I think, Rod, you saw a good, you read, read a really good survey uh, on your flight back the, uh, last night um, about what are more affluent worried about and what is the working man worried about right now? Yeah, well, the working man's working on inflation because let's face it, even if your wages are going up, they haven't outpaced energy costs and food costs, which are pretty important. <laughs> last time I checked, yeah, I found out this weekend when I went to the supermarket, my goodness gracious. Feeding you guys was like cost me a fortune. Well, Chris does like to eat, Bob. We know that. I know. Yeah, but you know what, Dad? I noticed that your grocery bill was down a lot because Ryan wasn't home to eat all the food. <laughs> it's true. There are leftovers waiting for him, though, Chris. <laughs> yeah. Thank God. Yeah, but I think the point here is inflation is really hitting every American. But the other big issue is politics on everyone's mind. It's a presidential election year. We know all the fear is going to be instilled to everybody that if your candidate, the one you want to win, doesn't win, it's going to be apocalypse now. But as we know, guys, in an election year, after the first 100 days when the market was positive, you usually get great returns the rest of the year. Historically, presidential election years are great years for the stock market. Yeah, but it's not kind of following the script, right? Usually, there's a lot more volatility, a lot more downside volatility. Now, if you're a client of ours listening to this right now, you're going to say, hey, Bob, what was April, right? The two biggest down days of the year, right, as they priced your statement. Um, if that's not downside volatility, I don't know what is. But it's not really as severe as it's been in the past election cycle. Yeah, just, I mean, look at the last election. You know, the market was crazy volatile up until the election. It's amazing what happened. As soon as we realized there was going to be a sitting president, market shot right up. Yeah, and it's hard to get your, your hands around. But I think the bottom line here is you don't want to wait to invest. You know, we've talked about this a lot, that 5% treasury. So seductive right now to put your money there. But when you factor in inflation and taxation, you're barely getting a return right now. And let's face it, like the global economy is starting to pick up. We're going to see global growth this year, not just in the U.S. China is starting to come out of this huge real estate uh, bubble that burst. We're starting to see demand for commodities go up in a big way. So what I would call like China proxy uh, type of economies like Brazil that export lots of commodities. Their stock market's cheap. They're going to be selling a lot of commodities overseas. It's huge for their market in a positive way. So there's a lot of global economies that, that are going to benefit hugely. And in fact, if you look at world economies right now, markets, they're all at record highs. So it's not just the U.S. that's doing well, and most markets are on sale. So broadening out that exposure, like, that's what you need to be doing right now. I agree. I think, you know, I read everything I possibly can. And it's amazing how certain experts who are very learned individuals, they get a certain opinion about something, and they twist themselves into a pretzel, <laughs> you know, try to explain why their thesis is wrong. You know, something's not working. Like copper, for example. Dr. Copper is going through the roof. And it's because perhaps China is emerging out of their recession or their depression, right? Perhaps the global economy is growing a lot faster than it has the last couple of years. You know, perhaps Europe, the, you know, the central banks are cutting their rates sooner than the U.S. It's like they're not open to anything other than, you know, what they think is going to happen. That's why, you know, if you're an investor, you can't listen to these people and buy everything they're selling. Bob, I think it comes down to broadening horizons and broadening out your portfolio. There's lots of opportunity right now to win over the long term, especially if you're preparing your portfolio for financial independence. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 153, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan and you want a more hands-on approach, Bob, Chris, and I now have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning investing. This is what we do every single day. 
We'll put together for you a total financial master plan. We'll do a bird's eye view of your entire financial life and hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. In fact, we'll build you your own personalized financial portal. We'll go through and look at everything you need from an income plan for retirement. How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you take social security? We'll do a full deep dive of your total portfolio. Look at your diversification. Have you had way too much money in the market? Have you seen your portfolio go up and down like a yo-yo? Or have you been sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do? We'll put together a full investment game plan. We'll show you how to grow your wealth, tied to your goals, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, insurance product, structured product, brokerage product. We'll do a deep dive of all those investments show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's now what you make, it's what you take. You'll get a full tax playbook. If you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click on the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And guys, when it comes to financial planning, one of the biggest concerns all of us have is sustaining our lifestyle in retirement. We all want financial independence. And you know, given our recent experience with record high inflation, um, you know, we've had an extremely contentious presidential election this year, or just all the different geopolitical issues go around the world, I have to say it's probably more urgent than ever that you make the right financial decisions when it comes to your portfolio and your financial life. So I thought we could discuss just how important addressing those three major concerns are right now, because I know it's on everybody's mind. Well, I'll tell you what, it's on everybody's mind and it's weighing on everybody's pocketbook. You know, when you look at inflation, we keep talking about inflation moderating. Yeah, it's coming down from that 9% growth uh, a year that was happening uh, after COVID or during COVID. But, you know, even at 3%, 3.5%, even if it gets down to the Fed's target of 2%, you're talking about price increases that have been dramatic, you know, 20%, 30% over the last three years. Those prices are coming down. You're compounding those prices at a higher level. So inflation should be a big concern when it comes to your plan. Yeah, I actually, it was a, I met with a client the other week, and she called me up and said uh, that she needs to take more money out of her portfolio. She said, is it okay? Can I do that? Is that allowed? And I went and showed her her projections over the last couple of years. I said, yes, not only is it allowed, but we've also planned for it. You know, things become more expensive as time goes on. And you absolutely have to put those things in your projections. Yeah. And I think right now it's like, you don't want to win the battle. You want to win the war. And the battle is, oh, I parked my money at 5% in a money market fund. But again, if inflation's over 3% and you're taxed on that treasury bond or that treasury money market fund at your marginal tax bracket, you're down to like a zero to a quarter percent return on your money. And last time I looked, look, I'm not a financial uh, magician. That's really hard to beat out <laughs> cost of living if you're only growing net of taxation and inflation at a quarter percent. Um, so it's so important right now that you're proactive with your money and grow it because it's not like the last decade when we did have really, really low inflation. And who says the Fed's going to get back to their target, right? I mean, we have reshoring going on now. We have higher oil prices than we had the last decade. Inflation could stay higher for longer. And I don't think most portfolios are prepared for that. Well, this is the thing I love, guys. It's like when it comes to investments, investments are not bought, they're sold. And, you know, we've been talking about moderating inflation. Well, what's been happening with the price of gold while inflation's been moderating? And somehow these sites, you know, these people that are, you know, pushing gold on television are telling us they're a great hedge against inflation. Well, why wasn't it going up when inflation was going up? Why is it going up now while inflation's going down? Wait, what do you mean? I, I get all these great emails in my inbox about gold that I forwarded you a couple of them. You know, they have all these great uh, great benefits of gold. I mean, how could it be bad? Well, the other thing is, okay, let's get those commemorative coins and make it even more illiquid so nobody wants them later on. Uh, <laughs> so by the way, it's where they make their money, right? They, You know, there, there's very little commission in terms of buying gold. Uh, the cost comes into storing gold as a higher capital gains rate when you sell it because it's considered a collectible. But these big gold uh, companies that are that are always pushing gold in these TV commercials, they make their money selling coins. And those coins have a big spread between what they will sell it to you for and then what they'll buy them back as. So you've got to be aware. Buyer beware when it comes to hedging against inflation with gold. But again, guys, that's why equities are the only inflation hedge out there. 
Well, and if you're going to buy commodity, the true commodity hedge is oil. <laughs> we actually use oil in society. Um, you know, if you buy energy companies, you're getting a fat dividend. You're getting paid to own uh, the commodity and, you know, from a producer uh, that sells it. And also, we just know from supply and demand that we're not producing enough of it. And there's a lot of restraints on production. Yet oil demand is going to continue to rise over the next decade. So if you're going to have an inflation hedge in your portfolio's commodity, I'd rather own oil than something that looks good around the neck of, the, of that someone that you love. Well, you know, the other point you guys are making here is, is geopolitical risk. And I don't know, is it because the consumer has the tension span of a mosquito that, you know, that all these issues that are flaring around the world right now get pushed to the back burner so quickly? I mean, what is that? Well, I think we uh, here at home like to think about things only that affect us directly on a daily basis and oil prices haven't gone up. But to your point, Bob, there's a lot of geopolitical issues going on right now. Um, another reason you don't want your portfolio concentrated in any one area. You know, you have to think about having that all weather portfolio because what if oil shipping prices go up? I mean, do you have a component of your portfolio that addresses that? And I'd argue that most of us don't have that all weather portfolio for whatever could happen overseas, not just here in the U.S. What almost seems like, you know, all these geopolitical risks are concerns, but they're never certainties. Um, you know, I've had calls from clients in the past is like, well, you know, we better get out of the portfolio now because Iran's going to have a nuclear bomb and they're going to, you know, they're going to nuke Israel or, you know, Taiwan's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of when, not if, you know, China's going to go over and take over Taiwan and all the semiconductors in the world will suddenly, you know, not exist. Um, and it's, it was interesting to see, you know, Putin visited uh, China and China's discouraging him from, from pursuing the war. I think that was the big surprise. Yeah, and I think that's what happens, right? If things are going to surprise you, you can't predicate your portfolio um, or your financial life on one all or none scenario because you just don't know. And I think that's the biggest mistake we make. Just like if who I want to get elected, we won't mention who, gets elected, um, you know, we're, we're in big trouble, right? The economy is in big trouble. Bad decisions are going to be made. And we know there's a lot of gridlock in government and the most extreme views or the most extreme pitch by whatever opposing force is out there, uh, you know, with their their policies usually doesn't come through. And we've got a lot of gridlock. And that's typically good. It's very good for the economy. It's good for the stock market. Markets do well in election years. So it's not smart to get into cash and wait and see. That's like a very bad strategy. Well, you know, it's funny you bring that up, Rai, because I heard this year that if you actually vote, it'll actually swing the election. But all kidding aside, I actually, uh, during the last election, you know, I spoke with every single one of my clients and my Republican clients said if Biden gets in, they're pulling out of the market. And the opposite was true. My Democratic client said that if Trump gets in, they're pulling out of the market. Well, guess what? They all ended up staying in the market and the market took off big time. So you, know, you really should let who's going to be in an office affect how you invest your money. Sounds like to me, guys, that uh, you got to live with the facts that inflation is existent. Uh, it's constant. It's probably the biggest risk to everybody's financial plan. You're going to have taxes. Most likely, those taxes are going to go up by the way the governments are spending money, both municipal, state, and federal. And you're going to have volatility, and volatility is a part of life. So if you're going to succeed as an investor, you need an evidence-based portfolio, a portfolio based on the evidence of historical rates of return. It's going to give you the highest probability of success. Trying to time it, trying to guess it, listening to pundits, sounds like something that ends in tears. Planning is about living with what you know and sticking to the strategy. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, the production of electric vehicles has surged in recent years. According to the International Energy Agency, China's EV accounted for 60% of all worldwide sales in electric vehicles versus only 0.1% in 2012. Man, that's huge market share over the course of the last decade. In April, the latest data available Electric vehicles now make up 59% of China's vehicle exports. No surprise, shipments of vehicles and parts to Russia have soared since the war, now encompassing 11% of all China's total vehicle sales. I was in Greece last week, and I saw my first Chinese car commercial. Man, oh man, China's definitely taken over in the international uh, exports for automobiles. Well, it's kind of hard to believe they actually have a car that only costs $10,000. Um, now, it has one windshield wiper. And uh, not much trunk space, but nonetheless, 
I don't think that's something that's going to play well in the U.S., but I think our U.S. manufacturers are concerned, as you saw, the tariffs are just raised dramatically on China, for especially for car imports and parts. But um, they're going to be the dominant manufacturer of EVs, and I think that um, that's a trend that you know you can't ignore. No, absolutely not, um, for better or for worse. Chris, it's good to be a baby boomer, a.k.a. Bob. During the boomer's adult lifetime so far, the Dow Jones Industrial Average has increased 40-fold from 1,000 in late 1982 to just over 40,000 a week ago. The S&P 500 matched that gain with its market capitalization rising from $1 trillion in 1982 to $40 trillion currently. And back in 1982, services only accounted for 50% of nominal GDP. It's now over 60%. So, Bob, we've gone from a service-based economy. Markets have gone straight up. Man, oh, man, it's good to be a baby boomer. Yeah, I'll tell you what, Ryan, I think you're missing out on the big point here. You know, Dad got into the business in the uh, late 1970s, and I think since then he's been encouraging everybody to invest. I think that probably has something to do with it. (laughs) I'm the Pied Piper of the uh, baby boomers, Chris. Is that what you're telling me? I think it might be. I think it might be. (laughs) I'll tell you what, that would have been a good time to start. You're a financial genie. Actually, the best time to start is when you have money because the market always goes up over time. Fair point. And Bob's hair is always the same style. So some, <laughs> like the sun rises in the east. Yep. All right. Well, another great episode, gentlemen. If you liked our episode, loved our episode, please, if you're watching this on listening to it on Apple, give us that five-star rating. Leave a comment. If it's on Spotify, you can subscribe to our channel. You can give us a, a rating there too. Five stars, please. And this is on YouTube right now. You can like this episode. You can subscribe to the channel. Click that notification bell. Be updated every week of all our new content. Your support gives us the support to continue to do this podcast. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at BeBullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Payne Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. 